I sail an ocean, unsettled ocean, through restful waters and deep commotion, often frightened, unenlightened. Sail on, sail on, sail on. Hello, I'm Dr. Gary Onick, and I'm your host for Cancer is Tough, But You're Tougher. I want to thank the Beach Boys for allowing us to use a piece of music that is dear to my heart. My podcast is uniquely personal. I know both sides of the cancer equation. I am a cancer specialist and researcher, as well as a cancer patient and survivor. I will address uh, various treatment modalities in the podcast, but that's not really what this podcast is about. This podcast is about uh, the unique cancer journey that a patient and their family and friends take when they are diagnosed and treated with this dread disease. We'll delve into the inner emotional and spiritual resources patients and their loved ones need to address their concerns of choosing a treatment strategy that will harmonize uh, with their worldview while grappling with state-of-the-art treatments uh, versus uh, alternative treatments. When I was asked who's going to be my target audience, the obvious answer was everyone. There's a rare person that has not had cancer touch their lives either as a patient, a family member, or a friend. If you're that rare person that hasn't had cancer touch their lives, wait a while. Almost certainly at some point, cancer will drag you into its maelstrom. I hope that you find this show both a resource and a comfort in dealing with your cancer journey. Stop the crying and the lying and the sighing and my dying. Sail on, sail on, sail on. I want to welcome Dr. Howard Friedman uh, to our podcast, Cancer's Tough, But You're Tougher. He's a retired pediatric ophthalmologist who lives in Naples, Florida. Dr. Friedman is renowned for his pioneering work in inventing a quick and low-cost way for screening children uh, as young as six months for amblyopia, one of the most prevalent causes of blindness in children, and his philanthropic work uh, with the Lions Club to bring this advance to as many children uh, as possible uh, have been recognized uh, as well. Dr. Friedman is a friend of mine for over 45 years. Uh, We met when I was a sophomore in college uh, through the Harvard uh, White Water Club. Uh, There he mentored me through my novice white water experience. Uh, I then uh, literally placed my life in his hands uh, when we traveled to the uh, Western United States to run some of the uh, famous big water rivers, uh, such as the Colorado and the Middle Fork of the Salmon River. Uh, He has quite an amazing story to share with us about uh, his unique cancer journey, and I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Friedman uh, to this podcast. Hello, Howie. Hello, Gary. Nice to talk to you again. Yeah, and thanks for for doing this. Uh, When you start a podcast uh, like this, uh, you have to depend on your friends because nobody else knows you. (laughs) Want to come on, so uh, <laughs> so it's greatly appreciated. Um, otherwise, I'd be talking to myself here. Uh, I'd like to start with your story of inventing uh, this method for diagnosing amblyopia in children because, um, well, it's about pediatric ophthalmology. I think that it uh, really does illustrate some of the issues that you you have to deal with when trying to bring a new technology on board and what the forces are that that uh, you have to uh, sometimes fight with. Uh, and so um, 
just tell us, uh, start out with what's amblyopia and what did your invention do? Uh, amblyopia is a uh, Greek term that talks about lazy eye. Um, and it indicates when a person does not have good vision because of a uh, abnormality in the brain that turns off the input from the eyes. And it occurs early in life and it is eminently treatable before age nine. Um, so if you pick it up early um, and correct the problems that are underlying it, which are usually three major problems. One is the kids have a bad refractive error, they're out of focus. Uh, or two, they have a, a cataract or something that blocks their view into the eye. Uh, or three, if they have a cross eye or a misaligned eye. Those are the three major causes of lazy eye uh, or amblyopia. And um, as a pediatric ophthalmologist, I started in practice back in uh, uh, 1979 in Redmond, Washington. And in practice, I remember seeing a number of kids. For example, there was a John who was an eight-year-old boy who came into my office. Um, and he was 2,400 in his right eye and 2020 in his left eye. And the right eye was much more farsighted than the left eye and had never been in focus. And at that point in time, the best vision I could get him to was about 2,100 with glasses. And I said, you know, gosh, it's really a shame that a child like this has a lazy eye that didn't get picked up in school or in school screenings or anything else like that. And now at age eight, nine years old, um, is well into the area where the brain is set in its ways so that the vision can't get really much better with time. We patched him and got him a couple lines better, but he really never had good vision. Amblyopia is the largest cause of unilateral vision loss in America because it's not picked up early. And it got to my attention that as a pediatric ophthalmologist, we had a condition, if we can pick this up early at age three or four, it would cure it because the brain is much more flexible and responsive to therapy at that age. So I said, we need to start screening kids early. And that was became my interest in amblyopia and early detection process. Great. And so um, how did you go about uh, uh, trying to solve that problem? Well, I attended a conference in England, um, and I found that a company had started um, a new technology of trying to screen kids with a, a new camera that they developed that was the size of a, of a refrigerator um, to screen kids' eyes. And in the next room, there was an uh, inventive young ophthalmologist from uh, Finland named Kerry Kakinen who had put a special lens on one of his cameras and was able to now take a picture of the eye with his camera and do the same job. And I said, that's a much better idea, but it needs to be Polaroid because we want to see it right away rather than be at that point in time film, which is in the mid eighties. So I went home and thinking about this and at a conference, I went up to the Polaroid booth and said, I've got an idea. Why don't we make a camera that uses a Polaroid film to do this. And they said, we don't do this. We sell millions of cameras, but we can lend you to our uh, division that uh, looks at experiments outside of our normal range called the OEM division. They, they hooked me on with that. And I met with some people up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who were ex-Polaroid engineers that they introduced me to. And I went into them and said, look, I've investigated this technology and here's how I think it will work. Uh, but I'd like to make it into a Polaroid camera. I said, can you do this? And they said, sure. And I said, sure, thank you very much. We shook hands, walked away. And about six months later, a big box came and it had my first screening camera. It was the size of eight, eight, 10 by 10 inches. Um, <clears throat> that is the easiest <laughs> medical development I've ever heard of. <laughs> And, all, you know, and I took it to the office, and Polaroid was very nice. They gave me as much film as I wanted, and I started testing the camera in the office on the kids, and it worked. And I was really surprised that it was, it was nice. So we had, essentially, over the next two or three years, we invented a smaller camera that worked better and actually got a patent on it, and eventually I sold the camera. Um, I didn't sell it. I sold the rights to the camera with a royalty to an inventor company called Medical Technologies Incorporated. And they began producing the camera as the first commercial photo screener and it used Polaroid technology. 
Uh, I did a study on it, I did a paper on it, and it turns out it worked. And then I went to present this to my colleagues in pediatric ophthalmology saying, hey, I've got this new technology, uh, it really works, and I think we ought to use it on all the kids. And it essentially got no interest. Um, and it actually got blocked by a lot of my colleagues who said, yes, you know, it's a nice technology, but we need to study it further, even though what I'd shown that it really worked. And so well, it and, took me and, a few years. You know, to back that up, it was low risk. I mean, it was it wasn't like you were doing anything that could hurt somebody. Uh, it, it was it should have been something that they would have been happy to try, at least. Yes, but many of my colleagues are researchers, and to them, they get funded to do research. And I understood why they wanted to do more research on it, because they can improve their careers and doing something like that. For me, it was, hey, I do get a royalty on it, and there was a financial incentive to sell cameras, but really I was into it because I wanted to cure lazy eye. Um, and it was an uphill battle to get it approved. Um, to go through all the process of getting uh, the, a code for it and getting people to approve it. Um, it was interesting that it was a tremendous um, process that took over 20 years before it became a recognized product that is now being used and became digital product. Uh, I have an interesting story. Uh, during the period of time that we were in this development project and trying to sell the cameras. The um, company made an arrangement with lens, uh, a company called Pearl Optical, who had per optical stores all over the nation. And he got an agreement with Pearl Optical uh, after they did a pilot project in Chicago showing that when they put it in their offices there, that the parents just loved it. They brought their kids in. The grandparents came in. They increased their business by 40%. And so Pearl said, we want to take this and do it nationwide and put it in 6,000 of our stores all over the country. This is back in the 1980s. And they signed a contract with the Medical Technology Incorporated, and they ordered the cameras. They were delivered and about ready to be distributed when they stopped. They put them in the warehouses and wouldn't send them out. The company that owned them which named Lexotica, which sold glasses to optometrists, was contacted by optometrists. And there's a feud between two types of optometrists. One type is in optical shops and the other one's in private practice. And they're both working for the same principle of just taking care of people and making money. But the ones in the private practice were afraid that the business increase in the optical shops with the camera use would take away their business and so they said to Luxottica, we'll stop ordering your lenses if you put these cameras in your office. And Luxottica said, we make more money selling lenses than we will, you know, in our offices. And they essentially told the company, the camera doesn't work, so we're not going to use it. And they got sued and they lost. Um, and they had to pay MTI a, a, a royalty payment for it or a settlement payment for it. I never got a penny of the money, although I helped him. You know, the end of, but, but at the end of the day, it didn't get out there to help kids. It didn't get out. And a lot of people, my biggest concern with that was that um, thousands of kids lost vision because they weren't detected early when they could have been if it had gotten out into the public at that point in time and got established. And to me, that's a real health care tragedy uh, that could have been avoided. But understood the interests of each individual, and it was all economic. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so much, there's there's there there's so much to learn from that story that pertains to uh, the world of oncology and the oncologic patient. That it's um, amazing. What it basically says: the same basic forces that you ran up against with a, an eye innovation that could have helped you know, tens of thousands of children, um, we see in, in oncology those same forces trying to stop us. I mean, the first uh, is the, uh, the academic uh, establishment. Um, when I came up with the idea of just treating a portion of a prostate, uh, focal therapy, which 
interestingly enough, 20 years later is now an accept. 20 years seems to be the time it takes to get something good going here. Uh, that, uh, you know, I had uh, members of the urologic community actually say I should be arrested for doing that because everyone up to that point treated the whole gland. Uh, and so uh, I think we, we uh, see that with the, um, the academic community. We see that with the companies that we have to deal with in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, it's it's uh, a very interesting correlate that um, uh, these are basic problems, not peculiar to one area of medicine, but peculiar to medicine in general, when you're trying to change the way things are done um, and it's expected. And so I don't take it personally anymore. I'm glad I wasn't arrested, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that uh, uh, it's something that right now I'm dealing with every day. So, so what I'd like to do is, is segue from that and and talk about what your cancer experience and how um, your experience in in cancer um, affected your life um, and how you dealt with it. Uh, I know that uh, shortly after you graduated from your residency, I, I believe, you were diagnosed with uh, a, a very serious cancer. Can you tell us about that? Uh, thanks, Gary. Yeah, I've, I've fought cancer before uh, and fortunately overcame it the first time. Um, and I'm, I'm doing the same thing the second time, um, thanks to you. The first episode was when I got Hodgkin's disease uh, in the 1979. I had just gotten married about two weeks before. And I got diagnosed uh, in St. Louis at Barnes Hospital um, with an advanced Hodgkin's disease that had spread from my spleen all the way up into my chest, into my neck. And at that point in time, it was a death sentence back in 1977 um, with only a few months to live. <clears throat> and at that point in time, I didn't know what the op op options were. The, the people in St. Louis um, said, well, when I asked the doctor who was the head of the oncology department uh, while I was in the hospital after the, having chest surgery to di make the diagnosis, I said, where's the best place for me to get treated? And he said, here. And I said, well, I know you got a good program, but where's the best place to get treated? And he said, here. I said, well, thank you very much. And turned to my wife after he left. <laughs> and I said, um, you know, I think this is the time when I have to take charge of my care because you can't trust doctors to have your own best interest. And I realized Whoa, that- Hold on, what the, that is a, that's a pretty sweeping statement you just made. Well, it, it, it happened to be true um, because I, I eventually found out that the best place to, to be treated, uh, which was told to me by a, one of my medical school colleagues who was a resident in oncology at an NIH, uh, who's now the director of the cancer center in the NIH, uh, he said, look, Howie, we've got a really good program here. The person has the best treatment for us with the best results is in Stanford named Sal Rosenberg. And I said, what's his phone number? And he gave me his phone number. Um, and so I went there. That was, here, this is a second opinion. Uh, I got another opinion from my colleague in uh, Harvard that I trained with who said, you know, NIH or, or Stanford were the best programs. So I went to Stanford got on a plane right out of the hospital, and I went to Saul Rosenberg and Henry Kaplan, who were doing innovative treatments for um, Hodgkin's disease at that time, and were actually curing patients that had never been cured before, primarily with radiation therapy. And they combined chemotherapy and radiation therapy together. I entered their program, and it turns out that it cured me. Um, and now, 43 later, I'm still in remission from my Hodgkin's disease. An interesting story was I was sitting in, my, um, in the waiting room and I was um, talking to a gentleman right next to me. And I said, where are you from? St. Louis. And I said, what do you have? Hodgkin's. And he turns out he had the same type and stage as me. And I said, why are you here? He said, well, they almost killed me in St. Louis. I said, what? <laughs> he said, well, 
they decided they weren't going to take my spleen out, which I had taken out at Stanford, and we're going to radiate it. And my platelet count got so low, I almost bled to death. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So he was now at Stanford to get treatment. And I never heard about it until 40 years later, what happened to him. And it turned out he died next year because he got it too late. And I was very lucky because I said to myself, there would have been me if I had gone to St. Louis and they had done the same thing to me. Um, so it turned out to me that my head ability to be able to search out the best program and the best treatment option really helped me because it allowed me a path to recovery and a successful treatment. And to me, I think that's the message. Always get a second opinion. Um, not no, Don't trust your doctors, but always trust but verify. Verify where the best place is to get the best treatment. Don't you think it's difficult um, for lay people particularly now with the internet. Uh, uh, patients are inundated with information. A lot of it may be wrong. Uh, they may be uh, uh, pulled into a program in Tijuana uh, that promises to do certain things for them. Um, it, it's, you know, patients are in a really difficult situation right now because they have to do what exactly what you've said. Uh, they have to do some of their own research uh, because um, they are not necessarily getting what might be best uh, for them. We see this all the time with prostate cancer patients, uh, where patients who might have very aggressive prostate cancer, um, who uh, an operation would not work well, where they might leave the cancer behind, get positive margins and, and leave the cancer behind, uh, where uh, they're getting those operations when they should be getting some other uh, well-known treatments that work work very well in those uh, uh, instances, but are not necessarily done by every institution. So it's a real problem. I don't think that there's a single good answer for patients except to get a number of opinions. Uh, maybe you can look online and and see what the options are and then you know, explore those with the doctors that you trust. Uh, very, very interesting. So uh, we come now and we are 45 years later. And we've had contact um, during those years. We're both, you know, sailors and, and, uh, and uh, you know, interacted over that time. Um, and then you get another diagnosis. And can you tell us um, what happened and particularly how you felt about it uh, suddenly getting another diagnosis with probably a similar prognosis? Uh, thanks, Gary. Uh, yeah, just to skew back, um, we've both been sailors. And Gary, I must admire you because when you got the shell of your boat during the eight, 2008 recession, when it, they'd stopped working on it, and you finished the boat out yourself, I had the greatest admiration for you for building out your catamaran and sailing it around the world, or at least many places. Other, I was very jealous. But I'll go back to the cancer. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. They told me back in, at Stanford that one of the side effects of the two side effects of the therapy is I could get heart disease later or I could get a secondary cancer. Well, I did get the heart disease and I had open heart surgery. And I was really lucky because it took 43 years before the um, secondary cancer came in. And last summer, um, about the, uh, August or September, um, I just wasn't having a good appetite. And I decided I had something going on with me and I took a, a feel into my belly and I felt that I had a little tumor there inside my belly and went to my GI guy and I said, I need to scan. I need to find out what's going on with me. And it turned out it was a, a, metastatic, a cancer that had developed in the middle of my uh, abdomen and it had spread to my liver. Uh, and that spread being metastatic put me into what they call stage four, which is advanced cancer. 
And as I looked, looked up the, the information on this type of tumor, which is a sarcoma, um, which is a soft tissue tumor, uh, and it spread, the, the life expectancy was six months to a year. And I said, well, that's not really good. In fact, I was really kind of pissed because I really wanted a lot of more time, but I didn't really seem like I was getting a chance for that. Um, I had a really good life. I accomplished a lot of things. So I didn't have a lot of regrets to it, but I still was doing a lot of good things for volunteering. Um, and I just didn't want to die. Um, and so I said, what, what do I do? So I, I investigated all the possibilities. And I went to my oncologist who had been taking care of me for years after my, my Hodgkin's disease and went up to a cancer center in, in Florida and got an opinion from the cancer center about what to do. And they said to me in, in, in Moffitt, uh, you need to get chemotherapy. Uh, and I said, mm, you know, the drug for the chemotherapy has heart problems, and I've got heart problems. I really don't want to take that. Is there any other type of therapy like immunotherapy do you do? And they said, well, you know, we've got two protocols here, but you have to go through chemotherapy first before you can get it. And I said, well, that's not good. Um, and I said, what I really want is immunotherapy because I've looked into it and I know that, that they've got some good advances in that for many other cancers. Um, and the later doctor said, well, we'd like to have it, but maybe we'll get it in six years. And I said, thank you very much. And I went out and said, you know, to my wife, geez, this is really frustrating. I'm really disappointed because this is not the kind of answer I wanted. I wanted someone to tell me what's the best innovative way, what are my options, et cetera, et cetera. So at that point in time, I reached out to some of my friends who were specialists like uh, Dr. Dorsho, who heads the, the deputy director of the Cancer Institute. And he gave me good advice, gave me some people to talk to. And I couldn't find any program that was going to really help me except for yours. And um, I had been following what you had been doing with uh, prostate treatment with uh, cryotherapy, which was incredibly innovative and was really reformative. Um, and then heard, after we talked, that you had been getting into doing a cancer vaccine, doing cryotherapy as well as immunotherapy directly into cancers. And I said, that makes good sense. That's what I want. And we had the discussion about what to do. And fortunately, you said, yes, I can do you. And that saved my life. Thank you. When I see and I talk to patients, I use a rule and, and, I, and, I, and I call it my medical golden rule. Basically, I, I say to myself, if I was in that patient's position, would I want this treatment? And if I come up with no, then then that's not something I should be doing to somebody because, um, you know, unless I'm willing to to have something, then I don't think that uh, I should be doing it to anyone else. And when I researched your situation, because obviously I knew virtually nothing about it, um, I was, you know, prostate cancer specialist more than anything else, really. Um, uh, there were no good options. And so we, uh, I think it was in a rather easy decision to say, let's give this a try. Uh, I was quite amazed. Uh, it was a difficult procedure um, because uh, there, we have a saying in medicine, uh, the enemy of uh, good is better. And so I'm working on one of my best friends in my life. And so, of course, I tried to do everything better. Um, and uh, in point of fact, it, it made things more complicated. We don't have to go through those. Uh, it reminds me of the story of my, my mother. Uh, she had uh, colon cancer and, and she was having a resection of the colon cancer. And I sent her to the best guy. I knew him. I had worked with him doing liver cancer treatments. And... Uh, and he treated her by the best guy, and she got sick afterwards, and he had left a sponge in her, and he felt absolutely awful, and um, I don't know why that happened, but more than likely, he was distracted by trying to do some, some extra things that, 
you know, he wasn't, uh, he didn't need to do. Uh, so uh, I was uh, quite amazed when we looked at your scan four weeks later and the abdominal tumor was gone. I mean, that was um, one of the uh, most wonderful moments in my medical career that we could see that happen. And we're still working on the liver, but we're going in the right direction. And I'm very, very hopeful that we're going to get a, a complete response. The last thing I want to ask you, Howie, is that uh, about how you deal with these more than bumps that, that happened in your life. Where did you get the strength from? And where did you and Pam, your wife, get the strength from to deal with these, um, you know, these major upheavals? Well, I got to tell you, it was one of the best days of my life when I saw the PET scan where my abdominal tumors, not just in my abdomen, but my pelvis, had disappeared and that the other tumors. And the second scan that I got showed that um, after the radiation treatment they do led me into with the Y90 particles, um, had worked also to help reduce the tumor. So I'm hopefully on the way to reducing the tumor and my sort of fingers are crossed for a long-term remission or a cure. But how do, how do I react to that? That's a really good question. Um, I think in life, you always have to think positive. Um, and although I fully realized that, and I got my affairs in order and realized that I could die, but I'm saying, look, if I could get more time, that would be really nice. Um, and we entered this with saying, you know, we accept the inevitable, you know, I'm 74 years old, and I've had a really good life, um, but I would certainly like more. Uh, and it involved four or five different areas. One is spiritual, you know, being positive, you know, asking my friends to pray for me, which they did. And I really think that that always, always helps. Um, having a really positive mental attitude, I remember uh, doing meditation when I was getting my first cancer treatment, visualizing my can my body's immune system, fighting my cancer off. And I don't know if that worked or not, but it couldn't hurt. So I did the same thing now. So every night I enter into a meditative state um, and I start to visualize internally, trying to get my cancer better. Um, it even led me into doing some supplements that seemed to help. Uh, one of the best things is that you got me to do a um, study in Europe that looked at my cancer in much more details than the studies that I'd had done in the United States. And although it is expensive, it came back with a whole lot of different information. And it turns out that the tumors that I had were responsive to a couple of the chemicals that you put in for checkpoint inhibitors, which was the basis for why it works. And it's continuing to work very well. And that gave me hope. And hope was really a nice thing to have. Um, I haven't had a sick day since I got diagnosed. If I had gone through chemotherapy, I would have had months of feeling bad. I'm, I'm very, very lucky that I was able to pick an alternative and find an alternative therapy. Um, and I think those are the internal issues. And just we approach every day on a positive basis and continue a, a normal lifestyle and enjoy golf and all the other things. But I'm really appreciative to you because I think you have a policy and a procedure that can really benefit people, and it's unknown. Um, it's not well-respected, uh, and it's not admired because most people have not done it before. And we have inertia in medicine that says, you know, I don't do that, and, you know, I don't see enough studies on it, uh, and therefore I'm not going to do it. Um, but it was very interesting. When I went back to my cancer specialist, Moffitt, and she looked at all the results and being a naysayer last month, she said to me, you know, I think we might have to look at a different way of doing things. I'm going to present this to my conference of my colleagues because maybe we're missing something that we should be doing. To me, that was music to my ears that someone from the establishment who was involved with 
just protocols and doing chemotherapy based on drugs that pharmaceutical companies were paying them for, um, now says, you know, maybe doing immunotherapy on a personalized basis, like what you did, um, really will help other people and cancer, make more cancer survivors. And to me, that's the biggest hope I have is that the example that you have set here with me will be able to reach out to many other doctors to say, yes, we can look at other alternatives rather than just the traditional stuff we're doing and really give people the hope and possibility of using the new technology and new techniques to help out their cancer. Howie, thank you very much. Uh, at some point, I'd like to get you back and talk about these other issues, um, the the process that you have to go through to, to um, you know, we're dealing with that right now. We're, we're, we're going through FDA studies. Uh, we're trying to do things responsibly. Um, and we're trying to check all the boxes. Um, and uh, uh, there are always issues uh, to deal with. Uh, I have found that um, the funding issue, and uh, it didn't seem like you had that issue, but the funding issue can be a real difficulty as well. Um, and uh, dealing with the big pharma can also be a, a very big issue. But I want to thank you so much for coming on and, uh, you know, sharing your story. And, and you said a, not a lot of nice things about me. Um, you know, your payment is coming in the mail for that. Uh, <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, it's all been greatly appreciated. And uh, we're going to hopefully have... Uh, Many more years to, to do the things we want to do and uh, some of them together. Thank you, Gary. And um, I wish you all the best of luck in, in getting your ideas out to the mainstream community and to people so that more people can be helped uh, like you've helped me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, this is the segment of the show where we uh, highlight uh, new advances in both cancer treatment, as well as cancer policy. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a very hopeful uh, bill that's been passed uh, by Congress, which is called the New Cures 2.0 bill. What this does is it links FDA approval to Medicare payment. At the present time, before this bill uh, linked the two, you could get an FDA approval of a device and it wouldn't be paid for. So therefore, the approval uh, was of little value if uh, the patients had no way of paying for it. This bill is, is really proof that when the government wants to help, they can do something really good. And so these two are linked, both approval and payment, approved by the FDA, payment by Medicare, and uh, the approval and this linkage goes for at least four years until uh, Medicare uh, looks at what is going on and that it is uh, efficacious and good for patients. So. Another hopeful thing actually coming from government. Thank you. This is the part of the podcast where we go to the mailbag and uh, listeners get to ask us questions. Please don't send in any questions that deal with specific medical information for you or one in your family. Uh, because uh, there's no way that I can give you a reasonable answer to a specific uh, medical question um, because I just won't have enough information and that would be uh, wrong of me. So uh, general questions um, relating to uh, your journey in cancer um, are more than welcome. So let's go to uh, today's question. Janet from Illinois asks, my mother has cancer that has spread to her bones. A friend of mine told me about a cancer center in Mexico 
that is getting results with natural therapies. I've looked at their website and the testimonials by their patients are very impressive. How do I know that they are on the up and up and credible and I will not be wasting my money by sending my mother there? Well, it's an interesting question. First off, just because they're in Mexico doesn't mean that they're not credible. Uh, if we are talking about um, a U.S. doctor who does work in Mexico, the first thing I would ask is, why isn't he doing that work in the United States? What's the reason? Um, is he using medications that uh, are not FDA approved and therefore um, he has to use them down in Mexico? Uh, the next thing that I would uh, say is that the best approach to finding out if something's credible is look in the literature. If you have uh, a physician um, in a clinic uh, down in Mexico who is saying, we're getting these wonderful results and they have testimonials, what you should do is get one of your physicians or physicians or one of your friends who is um, very uh, facile with the internet and go on Medline or PubMed, which talks about and shows you the literature. And you can put a physician's or researcher's name into PubMed and see all of the research that has been done and the results that they've published. If you put a researcher's or a physician's name in who is uh, touting a center with these marvelous results, if they haven't published those results, then you can't believe them. Because number one, it's their responsibility to publish those results if they're that good, so that other physicians can explore the same uh, possibilities in terms of patient treatment. Uh, but it's important uh, that um, they're looking at the results. It's amazing how uh, physicians can think they're doing well in one area until they look at their data and find out that they're not. Uh, it's particularly true of complications. Um, when I was doing um, spinal surgery um, a long time ago, I was a professor of neurosurgery before I went into strictly uh, cancer. Um, there was a, a complication when you did spinal surgery of where you actually doing the spinal surgery, you injured the aorta or injured the vena cava and patients you know, this life-threatening injury, you know, patients can bleed to death. Well, you know, that occurred in about one in 500 cases. Well, if you're a practicing surgeon and you're doing 50 spines uh, a year, then you're not going to see that complication for 10 years. And you're going to say that complication never happens. But when you look at things as a group, as a, as a, um, as a population, those things do happen. And so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a physician's obligation to publish their results, particularly if they are attracting cancer patients to a center. They owe that information to patients and they owe it to themselves because if you're not looking at your results, you really don't know how well you're doing. If you would like to ask us a question, you can go to garyonicmd.com. There is a contact form that you can fill out 
and it will send us your question and hopefully we'll be able to answer it on the air. Thank you for listening to our podcast. I hope that it provided you with some useful information, some hope, and some comfort. Thank you very much. Sail on, sail on, sail on. Sail on, sail on, sail on.